it's time to reconvene our discussions. And uh, I think panelists and myself, we are very pleased to see you in such big numbers because usually the morning session is the most difficult one, uh, particularly after yesterday's uh, wonderful dinner and probably conversations even after that. So, before I introduce our speakers, uh, I would like to uh, remind some of uh, events from last year's Riga conference, because after the conference, organizers sent out a questionnaire asking uh, what are their opinions about uh, the Riga conference uh, 2013. And there was only one criticism in those questionnaires, and the criticism was about lack of discussions on the Baltic Sea region. And particularly our foreign guests who came to Latvia were expecting that it will not be only uh, geostrategic, NATO, EU issues debated here in the audience, but also something about the Baltic Sea region. So, this year, it looks that organizers took a very heavy effort uh, to propose a topic related to the Baltic Sea region. And the title of uh, today's discussion is really very regional, of course, with a slight irony, the ghost of revisionism in Europe and the dangers it poses to the Baltic Sea region. So, we have to talk about ghosts, we have to talk about ghosts on the global level and then come back <laughs> to the Baltic Sea region. So, very wide spectrum. So, today we have three very distinguished speakers and uh, unfortunately our Polish guest was not able to come due to uh, some traffic arrangements, but uh, nevertheless, so uh, there is also a positive sign of uh, that unfortunate event because our speakers will have more time to present their views. So, uh, I will start with Simon Serfati, uh, who is a very good friend of Riga conferences. And Simon, I think you are coming almost every year, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. So, if it's ninth Riga conference, uh, it's Simon's ninth time in Riga. So thank you very much for coming here. <laughs> and Simon uh, Serfati is professor of U.S. foreign policy at Old Dominion University. Uh, also holds Vigna Brzezinski chair in global security and geostrategy in the CIS. And he wrote numerous publications. And uh, the most recent one is about Ukrainian crisis, which I read was a big interest. And Simon, later on, I even will quote some parts of your article. So, the second speaker of today is Dr. Ralf Brauchsiebe. Uh, thank you very much for coming. And he is a German Parliamentary Secretary of State, Ministry of Defense of Germany. Uh, and Mr. Brauchsiebe has a very distinguished political career in different posts. And uh, your political background definitely is an excellent one to discuss global and Baltic Sea region issues. Uh, then we are having Janis Sartz, uh, who is the State Secretary of Ministry of Defense of Latvia. Uh, and the Latvian audience, audience knows you uh, quite well, Janis, but it's really worth to uh, remind that uh, Janis Sartz was uh, uh, Defense Ministry's representative at NATO when Latvia was negotiating accession to NATO. So he was very much in engaged in uh, organizing NATO summit in Riga in 2006. So, and still Janis is uh, the one who was very actively engaged in uh, organization of Wales summit, summit, and I hope that you will come back to that issue later on in your speech. So, ghosts. Simone, I would like to start with you, and I would like to ask you a question. That uh, the topic of uh, geopolitical challenges on the global scale have been debated for years. And I think that whenever you come to Riga, you are speaking on the panel, which is devoted to geopolitical issues. And for years, we are listening here in this room that uh, we are facing geopolitical shifts, uh, geopolitical changes on the global scale. What is different this time? about what kind of geopolitical cleavages we should discuss these days? Simone, please. 
and 10 minutes for each. 10 minutes, that's good. That's much more than I had expected, uh, candidly. Um, you should thank Polish colleague. <laughs> if, if we're going to start with, with the big picture, then in fact I could do that in 20 seconds. Uh, because the big picture is blurred, quite frankly. Uh, all we know about the world is that it's moving. Uh, it's very difficult to get a hold on it. Uh, in part because uh, we don't know where it's going. Uh, the only thing we know is that it's going there pretty fast. Uh, therefore, there is not any unpredictability in uh, the conditions we face, but there is also a bit of urgency. Uh, remember that uh, the past centuries, in an odd fashion, uh, have been shaped during the second decade, uh, between 1911 and 1919, for example, for the 20th century, uh, between uh, 1811 and uh, 1818 for the 19th century, uh, between 1710 and 1715 for the 18th century. In all of those instances, you see forces in movement that condition what happens subsequently. And I'm fairly confident from that standpoint that over the next few years, we are going to evolve for the much better or for the much worse. But we will not stay under the same conditions. Now, this means that history has rushed back onto us. For a moment during the second half of the 20th century, we thought we had tamed it. Uh, in a sense, uh, after June uh, 6th uh, of 1944, uh, 70 years ago, through uh, the events in Germany on November 9th of uh, 1989, uh, uh, we thought that with the Americans in and the Russians, frankly, out, and Germany, quite frankly, having recast itself in a broader European context, uh, we had escaped this kind of difficult history that had plagued the first uh, half of the century. Uh, well, we were wrong. We were wrong. To the extent now that we are brought back into the house of the death, uh, where we find 165 million corpses accumulated throughout the first half of the century, and we are now being forced into trying to remember what history taught us uh, from uh, June 28th of 1914 through September 4th of 1939, when, in fact, the uh, war became a way of life for the states of Europe and uh, beyond. And, 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 and when history comes back to us, it, it makes us feel understandably uncomfortable, especially here, where really is to be found the geography of pain which uh, uh, populated uh, the 20th uh, uh, century. We, we, we suddenly are resurrecting the old guidelines of uh, the past. Uh, America is going home. Uh, Russia is expanding again, is surging uh, uh, again, uh, uh, the Europeans are getting tired of each other and of uh, their union. Uh, China is telling us and telling the Japanese, you know, we still have a few accounts to settle. There's still a lot of history amongst us. Even Islam wants to take us back 1,000 years ago. And, 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 and I think that uh, uh, to that extent, uh, and as I was listening to some of the conversation yesterday, I have the feeling that we are now, frankly, living and fearing the future in the past tense. And, and, and I'm uncomfortable with that. I'm uncomfortable with that because it is as if uh, we are working hard on trying to remember of history the difficult time. What I would argue as part of the big picture is indeed the future will not resemble the past. We have moved beyond that kind of, uh, of, 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 of a past. That we have to beware of facile, irresistible analogies, which might make good politics, but don't make good policy. No, no, no. Putin is not a clone of Hitler. Uh, Obama is not a 
repeat of Chamberlain, the, uh, the, the, the annexation of Crimea, however horrific it may be, is not another Anschluss. The, the Western alliance in the 2010s is not, frankly, a repeat of the Anglo-French West of the 1930s, and there is not a global uh, process of appeasement going on, whether related to Russia or uh, others. Uh, I say I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in ghosts. Uh, I, I want to deal with the new realities of the 2010s, including the, frankly, development of this extraordinarily successful Western Euro-Atlantic uh, community of states based on two pillars, one NATO and the other one the, uh, the, uh, the EU. And, and my first point as I look at the big pictures, therefore, is give me a break, give me a break. At half past Obama, it is too early to pretend that he has failed to manage the very serious disruptions and instabilities of uh, the moment. Remember that all U.S. presidents who took history one-on-one -on -one over the past 60 years performed best during the fourth quarter of their eight-year presidency, whether it is Truman or Ronald Reagan or even George W. Bush in 2007, 2008. And I expect, indeed, that the game is still on insofar as our ability to manage some of those issues. And second, at half before the post-American world, as it is called, American power, American leadership still remain preponderant, <coughs> even though it can no longer be as decisive as used to be the case. So I, I, I have a kind of constructive pessimism about the moment in the contemplation of that big picture. Uh, to be sure, I don't want to provoke, but I don't need to indulge. And the balance between provoking and indulging is indeed the challenge we face. Now, if I have two more minutes, there is nonetheless in that big picture blurred as it may be, some lines which have emerged over the past few years, and they are especially important to remember here in the Baltic states and for the totality, quite frankly, of, uh, of uh, Europe, because we do live in a world in mutation, mutation. This is not the kind of transition we faced in 1815 or in, in 1871 or in 1919 or in 1945 when the transition usually took place around the end of a war with a cleanly defeated state and a willingness to either restore a world or create a new world order. This world in mutation presents, I think, three characteristics and I will briefly outline them. The first characteristic is that with the proliferation of dozens of new emerging or re-emerging pools of power and influence which wish to assert the authority either within the region or in the world at large, no single state alone can attend to the multiplicity and the complexity of the issues we face, however preponderant that state is. We in the United States need allies. We need partners. Allies and partners that are not only willing, but also capable and compatible. And I insist on capabilities and compatibilities. Because this suggests, this suggests that those who are not doing enough must do more, must do more as it was stated in our discussion yesterday or repeated at the Wales Summit. But also insist on compatibility because there's too much talk of a reversal of alliances, of, of new alignments emerging uh, here and there. No such a thing is happening. The fact of the matter is that the fundamentals of geopolitics still apply. The enemy of our friends are our enemies. And we stated that bluntly, but Second, the enemies of our enemies are not our friends. 
And that is, I think, very important when you discuss the relationship with Iran, the relationship with Russia, the relationship of the United States and the West with other uh, uh, parts of, uh, of, of the world. So the need for reinforced partnership and alliances, I think that's very important. Second, the genuine domin dominant uh, axis of stability in the world today does remain the Euro-Atlantic relationship. I don't think we can escape that. When you speak of capabilities, willingness, and compatibility, if not the U.S. with Europe, with whom? If not Europe as a European Union, how? If not now, when? <laughs> and I think we need to insist on this as the axis of stability of that picture we're trying to... And third, and finally, please, 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 do not close the door and open the windows. <laughs> insofar that relationship is, is concerned. Gandhi was asked shortly after World War II, what do you think of the West? He said it would be a good idea. It was a subtle answer. It is now more than an idea. It's a reality, but that reality needs to be thought through. And if you open your window, you will see that there's a messy world out there which involves much more than Russia and much more than Ukraine. And it begins, frankly, with the South and the Middle East. I suspect that if we were to hold this conference later on this year into next year, we would be speaking less of Ukraine and we would be speaking more of conditions in the Middle East, including the fact that Iran and this kind of slow-moving nuclear crisis with Iran is running out of time. The negotiations will technically end on November 20th. They will be or will not be extended. We'll have to think of a plan B. So, blurred picture, we're beginning to see some trends. The long term is running out of time. We're getting there. Maybe I'll come back in 2019 and we'll speak about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Simone. You were absolutely precise, 10 minutes, and so <coughs> big picture and so much what to discuss. And you mentioned that history come back, comes back, and I'm thinking whether the history comes back to the Baltic Sea region. Uh, I was recently in one of conferences which lasted for four days, and everything was dis debated. And countries were participating in the debate were those around the Baltic Sea region. Environment was debated, migration, uh, employment, not a single word about security not a single word about threat to the Baltic Sea region. This feeling that history is coming back, and this part of the world, we really have this resemblance that history is coming back. Do you think that it's coming back to the Baltic Sea region? It depends what you mean, this particular case, quite frankly. I, I don't believe there's a credible plan for going to war with Russia and the United States. But I don't think there's a credible plan in Russia for going to war with the NATO state either. <laughs> And there's no incompatibility between those two ideas. Because in this case, history serves as the best deterrent against madness. And there would be much madness in the idea of a war in this context. So the question was asked yesterday, do we sleep well by night in Riga? I slept very well last night, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Maybe because I was a bit tired. But the fact of the matter is that I suspect that anybody in the 34 capitals of the NATO countries slept relatively well. Outside, it is different. And this is why I said, keep the uh, uh, door uh, open. But we're not falling back into 1914. We're not falling back in 1938. And we're not falling back in 1948. I think that the idea that the war, frankly, might be imminent, one way or the other, is a bit abusive. Thank you. Mr. Brauxib, uh, what about uh, German perspective on the history coming back to the Baltic Sea region? Uh, what are threats and what countries could do to avert those threats? Well, thank you very much. History coming back. There are some things I have in mind and that I want to share with you. It's, for me, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm not just, it's not just a routine quote, but... Uh, what I think about when, when being here is uh, different things. In 1986, I went to Berlin for the first time and I saw the wall. In 1987, I went 
to Moscow for the first time in my life and I was brought to an ice hockey match of ZSKA Moscow against Dinamo Riga, <laughs> which was a normal match in the Soviet National Ice Hockey League, which does no, no longer take place there. And the fact that these things have both changed, that the Berlin Wall has vanished and that Soviet suppression on Latvia does no longer exist. So German reunification and Latvian self-determination and independence are not two things completely separated from each other, but it had to do with the fact that, roughly speaking, 25 years ago, there was great progress for freedom in Europe. I did never believe that this was the end of history. Uh, we should not forget that this was a very important and great progress. And of course, Russia's blatant breach of uh, international law on the Crimean Peninsula and the actions that Russia undertakes in East Ukraine is of a new quality, no doubt about it. And I'm convinced <clears throat> even if tensions go down again, the world in Europe will not be the way it was a year ago. Certainly not, and we have to face these challenges. But also with regard to history, I would clearly support what you said before. One lesson we have had to learn in Germany is indeed that the enemy of my enemy is not my friend. You know, in, in former times, in Cold War times, in that part of history, the separated West Germany disposed of a conscript army of about half a million soldiers. No, none of these one million boots on foreign grounds at that time. Today we dispose of an army of a bit less than 200,000 soldiers and sometimes, especially in Afghanistan, almost up to 10,000 out of the country in being engaged in international mandates. That is a significant change. In former times, when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, some of us thought that those who were verbally the greatest opponents of Soviet intervention in Afghanistan were our friends, some of the Mujahideen. And we did not see that they did not share our values at all. And so it is also a question of values. So what unites us, Latvians and Germans, our EU member states and the NATO member states, is not just a, a combination of uh, similar strategies, but first of all, that we share the same values. And this is what, what I've, I'm strongly convinced that at the end, our idea of rule of law, of democracy, and of a free market economy, that will prevail at the end. Also after such a crisis that we have to face now. And so in contrast to former times, we have asymmetric, asymmetric threats and hybrid warfare today. That was different in Cold War history. When we disposed of half a million soldiers in the 1980s, everyone, each of these soldiers was clearly aware when a crisis occurred what he had to do because it was clear where the crisis would come from, namely from the East. Today that is different and we should not follow the, the trap that Putin wants to uh, <clears throat> make us follow when he said uh, that if the EU imposed or the NATO imposed sanctions on Russia, this would mean that we did renounce at the common fight against ter terror or the terrorists. This is not the case. The atrocities uh, committed by the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria cannot be an excuse for what Russia did in Ukraine and vice versa. So these are different challenges and we have to concentrate on both of us. And from the German point of view, it is very important to have all these crises and challenges in mind. So that's why a couple of days ago we decided to engage in uh, Iraq in a way that was not normal in our history, but we do not neglect the challenges and the threats that we see here in the Baltic region. And that's why we have decided to engage much more here 
than we've done before. We are more engaged in Poland now, especially in the multinational core northeast in Chechen. And we have decided to engage more for the security of the Baltic states. We are here present for a couple of weeks now with our Eurofighters in Estonia to protect the whole Baltic region. And we are convinced that we have to do more exercises to, be, uh, to, to adapt ourselves to the situation and to be aware to what might happen. So we'll have four exercises in the rest of the year in Germany with regard to the situation here. We will participate in four exercises in this year in Poland and in the Baltic states with some 300 soldiers. And we have decided to continue and to intensify our engagement. So for the next year, we are planning the participation in five exercises in Poland and the Baltic region with 1,700 German soldiers. So this is a consequence that we see out of, the, out of the crisis and the necessary reaction we have to take. So we do not just react with words, but really with actions. And it is our perception that we need a coherent structure of NATO and EU and that among both organizations there must be a focus on more efficiency, on uh, uh, burden sharing and of a clear uh, <coughs> of, of a clear sharing of capabilities because NATO indeed is a strong a, a very strong organization. We, clear, we clearly see that and we clearly believe in that. And this is the reason for our engagement. We see that we are sitting in, we are sitting in the same boat. Again, Latvian independence and German reunification were the result of the same movements in history. And we are clearly committed that this part of history, that these successes will not be drawn back. We, to, to some extent, uh, I can understand that Russians might feel annoyed that democracies surrounding them do not want to be too close to them, but that they want to belong to the West. Um, sometimes in Germany there is a debate, was it our fault, what happened? Germ Germans tend to, to, to look at the faults that they might have made, also with regard to Ukraine. The result for me is no. I mean, it was not the West that forced Ukraine to negotiate with the EU. We didn't force them. We always asked them. We often asked them, are you really committed to a closer engagement with the EU? And the answer was yes, until November uh, last year. And we, the Western countries, had to accept the decision of the former Ukrainian government. It was the Ukrainian people who didn't want to accept. It was not us to doubt that. So I think it was the right way to offer more alignment to the West, to all the sovereign states. And now we, we have to see that the partnership that we had with Russia does no longer exist. Our minister has clearly stated that Russia is no partner anymore. But I'm convinced that the alliances that we, we have joined together, NATO and EU, are strong enough to, uh, to secure all of us. And you can be sure that we will play a very active role in securing the freedom and self-dependence of the Baltic states. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, uh, I also was thinking about this question that we are asking ourselves, is it the EU fault what happened ah. in Ukraine? And I'm wondering whether authorities in Russia and society in Russia is asking the same question. So I would like really to know that, but it's not the point of our <laughs> discussion uh, today. No, <laughs> obviously not. Uh, so, so what some very experienced people have told me that there is one important difference with regard to the Ru Russian population uh, with regard to Soviet times and today. In Soviet times, people tell me the Russians were aware that they, th that, uh, that was propaganda what they saw on TV, that it was not the reality. 
but today it is still propaganda, but many people seem to believe that it is right what they, what, what they, what they see and hear in the Russian media, although it is propaganda. So, I mean, this, this is the difference, and this is indeed a challenge for democracies, no doubt about it. We have to convince our people. And, uh, I mean, the consequences that the Russian population has to face due to the sanctions that we have imposed, that we had to impose, in Germany it would be impossible that the population would accept that in such a way. But this is the difference between Western democracies and other kinds of uh, state organization. It, sometimes it is it causes challenges, but as I said, I am convinced at the end our model will prevail. Thank you. Uh, Janis, uh, uh, you yesterday uh, also followed a discussion uh, on Wales Summit, and Julian, where is Julian? Hmm? You asked <laughs> this question to introduce your concept of Riga test. So, and uh, two ministers of defense, Raimond Sveju and Senanso, a Norwegian colleague, agreed that uh, the Baltic test, uh, uh, Riga test, has been passed. Uh, I would like to ask you, Janis, what do you think? What would be the answer of Sweden and Finland? Do they pass Riga test? <laughs> well, uh, let me start from the... Uh uh, from the statement that some say that uh, European uh, security architecture has collapsed since uh, Russia moved into Ukraine and, and say that I only partly agree to that statement. I would agree that trust has collapsed. Some red lines of not annexing other countries' territory uh, is not more a red line. Uh, I would agree that both UN and OSCE are not capable of doing anything. But I would say two pieces of European secu security architecture that are very important to us still remain, and that is both NATO and EU. So it's still there. And that was a piece probably the Russians wanted to go away the, the first. But these two pieces have become stronger through the Ukrainian crisis. But I see them as two elements that are interlinked and uh, to be seen uh, in the context of one, uh, one another. And I agree with the yesterday's panel's uh, talk, uh, Juli uh, Julian was, uh, was, was moderating, that uh, military capability is important to prevent Russian further moves, and that is a problem for Helsinki and Stockholm. They don't have NATO, and probably I wouldn't say they should be very scared during their nights. They are strong countries, but they don't have that guarantee. And as far as I've heard, Russians would do a l go at lengths. To, to make it very hard for Finland and Sweden to join NATO right now. So they have not used the opportunity at the time when it was comparatively easy. Then, now, when there might be more of a reason and some part of population might start to agree with that, it is becoming more difficult. So I would say um, they are in more difficult situation than the they should have been if they made the right choices, if I may put it that way. Uh, uh, because, as I said, I believe the military element uh, is important. Then, uh, I think another element is, is also very important in this context, and that is um, this crossing of red lines is not only the, uh, the thing that will have a consequence here in the Baltic Sea region or in Europe. Many others are watching what's going to happen. That's been long since a major international player has dared to cross the borders in such a manner. And I think there are many that have some sense of the revisionism around the globe, and they're seeking what would be the West's answer 
and what would be the price Russia pays for crossing that line. And if the conclusion from this observation is it's not that high and you can get away with it, I think this blurred picture will become even very dark picture because that would open many doors that would be interested to revise the existing uh, status quo and would make our lives, and I would agree we should not just look at Ukraine, it's, it's only one piece of a puzzle, even more complex, even more insecure. And another thing I think uh, is also uh, important to understand, Ukraine is just one piece of the sequence in events. You have, uh, you have uh, Georgian war, you have Ukraine, you have the, uh, the relationship with other Russian post-Soviet, Russia relationships with other post-Soviet states. It is a sequence of events and we have to approach it not through the angle of just Ukraine. We have to look at a wider uh, s uh, spectrum. The other point I think is that's why Ukraine is important. The way we will be able to solve this crisis will determine how much appetite Russia and other potential revisionist powers will have in the future. And uh, I think uh, it is difficult to say how we'll pass that test. Uh, and that will have immediate uh, implications for our region as well. Well, first, yes, we'll be in a, in a in a region where there's a border between the, where there is an architecture of security, both NATO and EU, and where is the, the revisionist power seeking to change these borders. So it will be a tense situation for the time to come. But I think the most difficult uh, it will be for the uh, other post-Soviet states, because they don't belong to that architecture. And if Russia succeeds, there will be more instability, and that instability will come to haunt us in one way or another. So what we have to really look uh, at the way we respond to it. And, and I would say the, the strategy is our, on our, of our response as NATO, as EU, we have to combine hard power with soft power as much as possible, and hard power, hard power being a very important element, specifically talking about strong deterrence capability in the areas where it matters, in the Baltics, in the Poland, in the Baltic Sea region. Strong, soft power capability. Uh, I include there, of course, economic power, and I think we will have to look that sanctions are looked in a long-term context. Uh, we have to look at the other elements, and I very much am pro um, proponent of our the need to raise our ability in the, in the information sphere, in the battle for the people's minds that we've sort of neglected or have taken for granted and the other side has taken it as a, as a good possibility for them. Um, we, I think there has to be a debate and uh, I would certainly promote that uh, uh, the societies of Sweden and Finland actually talk about their mem NATO memberships because I think that's in our all general interest to to have these countries part of NATO. And I think another part of the strategy, we have to uh, pay serious thought and action to those countries that are our Easter partners. And not just with the words, but with actual help in a military area, in the economic area, in the state building area. Of course, we've tried to do a lot of that, and many countries have not been very successful, especially in the latter. But I think everybody has to understand that the strategy Russia has employed versus Ukraine works with the weak states. So that's their own interest in a very short period of time to become strong states, and we have to concentrate it. Uh, and and we have to recognize that they are in between two strategies. The one of ours, which is of open door, through which is very difficult to get through, and the other, 
of Russian strategy of a closed door behind which there's one bully who beats up anybody who has an indifferent opinion, including Kazakhstan. Thank you very much. Yeah, because very good point. So not only Kazakhstan, Armenia as well, and we can continue this list. So thank you very much, Yanis. Uh, there are questions coming in already uh, via uh, our sophisticated equipment, but now it's time to uh, give floor to audience for questions. And being uh, European, I will try to keep regional, gender, and other balances at place. So let's start with the left side. Could you please give a microphone here? Here are two hands, and I will continue Julian's pass. So three questions, uh, or like, okay, four, because we have three speakers, and then there will be the next round, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dmitro Kondratenko, um, Kiev uh, Ky um, School for Policy Analysis, Ukraine. So uh, my question is uh, to Simon uh, Serf Serfiti. Um, about uh, the geopolitical cycle of Russian expanding and decreasing. So it is noticeable that uh, um, Baltic states were occupied and Finland was attacked during after the interwar period in 22 years. And the same with Ukraine. <coughs> after gaining independence, it was attacked by Russia after 22 years of independence. So perhaps maybe there is uh, some <coughs> kind of a geopolitical cycle of decreasing and expanding for uh, <coughs> Russian state or maybe perhaps Soviet Union. And uh, if I may, uh, the second question to uh, Yanis Sartz about uh, the capabilities. So uh, when uh, are is, uh, Latvia or maybe you know some other Baltic states are going to get their own um, battle aircrafts because uh, the battle aircrafts proved uh, to be uh, very <coughs> uh, uh, effective against uh, Russian insurgents in Ukraine, so perhaps uh, there are plans or something like that. Thank you. Thank you. And question here. Just, yeah. Michael Salin from uh, a former uh, State Secretary of Defense of Sweden. So I uh, appreciated, of course, a lot your comments on the importance of uh, the NATO issue in, in Sweden and Finland. I cannot comment on Finland nor of Sweden because we have elections on Sunday. Okay. And we have uh, <laughs> tomorrow. So maybe on Monday we'll know more about uh, who is at least ruling Sweden. But I have uh, three questions to our to my German colleague, if I may say so. Um, I think uh, the role of Germany in the current situation is uh, watched by many as one of the crucial elements. So, three questions for you. One, was it wrong, right or wrong or meaningless to ask whether the EU on its own should have extended an offer of full membership of the EU when it launched the uh, Eastern Partnership? Was that uh, part of the problematic that the EU was unable to somehow agree on actually extending a membership offer that was clear enough as a basis of, of decisions for that country. So your comments on that. And secondly, what you said about the Baltic Sea, does it mean also uh, enhanced German naval presence on the surface and other, in other uh, spheres in the Baltic Sea? And finally, if I may, the decision by Germany to uh, send arms to the Peshmerga is seen by many as a, as a hallmark decision. Will that symbolize greater German foreign policy activism, so to speak, and is there consensus in Germany around these issues? Thank you. Thank you. And Julian, yeah? Is there a mic in the back, please? In the back. <coughs> Thank you very much, Julian Lindley French. Um, last night, uh, Sukhoi, 26 Russian aircraft approached Latvian airspace amidst heavy electronic jamming. Didn't appear until the last minute. Um, strikes me this conversation, there are two realities, maybe three, that we have to consider. One is Russia is unpredictable. And unpredictability of great power is a dangerous commodity. Second, Russia's modernization program, and should we say NATO's lukewarm modernization program, strikes me that by 2020, 
we could possibly not provide defence of the Baltic states, which makes collective deterrence probably more important than collective defence. It's good to have a theoretical debate, and I agree with Simon that history can never be backed by definition. But geopolitics is certainly back. So could the panel give me some idea of a clear strategy and clear policy, A, to cope with the uncertainty of Russian policy, and B, to cope with the changing shift in the balance of power, given that this is not a theoretical debate, given what happened last night, and frankly, which is happening on almost a daily basis now. Thank you, Julian. And I add one more question, which is sent in by Richard Bambals, who asked a question uh, to Mr. Brauchzipe, and he writes that if uh, German troops start loving Latvia, what about their presence in the region beyond 2015? So, gentlemen, please uh, try to compose those different questions addressed to you, and uh, let's start probably, Simone, with you. Hmm. That's, uh, uh, <clears throat> I just don't believe in a domino theory involving <laughs> Russian expansion. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just don't, and, and I, I'm not going to be able to convince anybody who is emotionally <laughs> committed to that uh, notion for understandable reason. Uh, history owes this region. <laughs> history owes Ukraine. More Ukrainians were killed by German soldiers during World War II than the combination of French, British, and American soldiers. Three million non-Jewish Poles were killed <laughs> during that war. We we owe it, we owe it, but I believe that, in fact, history moves on, <laughs> moves on. I would start my assessment of Russia not with the unpredictability of its behavior, as Julian indicated quite properly, as Julian always does, properly, but I would insist on the predictability of Russian limitations. I mean, I want to do an audit of Russian weaknesses. Russia is a state that is running out of people because it is engaged into a pattern of self-induced genocide. It is a state that is running out of security space because all around it, NATO, EU, Islam world, China, are present and frankly on occasion intrusive, and it is a state that is running out of renewable resources. Okay. And on that basis, I believe that Russia is not an ascending power. It is, in fact, a state that is reaching its limits and is running out of time. Now, this does not comfort me, because it may well be that to the extent that Putin would understand, unlike the Soviet leaders after World War II, that is running out of time, he might be tempted to maximize his gains while he's allegedly on top of the world. But it is not sustainable. And therefore, if that is the case, I don't indulge him while having done whatever I could to not provoke him. Now, if I may add one thing with regard to Ukraine as well, because I think it is important. We, it is very difficult to assess the significance of a specific event until we have lived out its consequences. It's very difficult. You know, we tend to respond to the headline. Two months ago, we were discussing Crimea. The, the word hardly comes up now, <laughs> okay? There are two things about the Ukraine situation which bothers me, which have not really come up sufficiently outside to repeat of the fact that, frankly, in Ukraine,
Putin's hands are really very dirty, but we all have dirty hands too, including the Ukrainian government. We all made mistakes when managing Ukraine over the past 20 years. But there are two things which I learned from the Ukraine situation thus far. If you're a member of NATO, stay in. If you're not, join. <laughs> Because I think, indeed, NATO membership does provide this kind of rampart against madness. And we should be more focused on the circumstances under which the doors to institutional enlargement for both NATO and the EU will be reopened. It does not mean that I'm going to put on the table right now Ukrainian membership on either one of those institutions. It's a non-starter or for that matter, that of a couple of other things, but I would certainly look into the Balkans, for example. But that is a very important lesson. And no one who is a member of NATO today is thinking of leaving. <laughs> the friend I've long forgotten about it. And second, which is very important as well, if you have nuclear weapons, keep them. <laughs> if you don't have nuclear weapons, get them. And frankly, this is why I'm focused on conditions in the Gulf. Because there are states which have been learning their lessons. And it is not about the Russian invasion next of the Baltic states. Let's deal with reality. Let's be real. It is about how complicated the negotiations with Iran and with North Korea and others have become in that uh, context. Thank you, Simone. Mr. Browskeeper. Well, thank you very much. First of all, the question, what happens beyond 2015? I mean, I beg your pardon. First of all, one year ago, no one would have ex expected what has happened with regard to Ukraine. And so now, I think we, we've just had a very successful NATO summit. The measures we have agreed upon with regard uh, to assurance and adoption, these were good decisions. We have taken, as Germans, we have taken decisions with regard to exercises in 2014 and 2015, and you can be sure we are ready to take over our responsibilities also in the years to come. But we do not declare that we can foresee everything that comes, but of course uh, we do not see December 31st, 2015 as the end of our responsibility in systems of uh, c collective, uh, c collective defense, no doubt about that. Um, regarding the questions from uh, my Swedish colleague, first of all, regarding uh, naval presence, we are already providing both naval and air force assets that are participating in assurance measures, and specifically we continue to provide 25% of the overall assets within the framework of the standing naval forces. And you asked about uh, Ukraine and EU. Well, first of all, I never talked about EU membership. This was not the issue. And everyone who knows, and everyone who is familiar with EU knows that uh, EU membership is always a very long way, a longer way than NATO membership for many countries. This is what our Croatian friends experienced, what our Albanian friends experienced. We didn't talk about EU membership of Ukraine, no one talked about it, but it was the question of an association agreement between the EU and uh, Ukraine, which is much different from membership. But that's what we discussed, and I mean, as I said, we didn't force anyone. We neither forced Ukraine nor any other country to negotiate with us on any part of uh, uh, approachment of the EU and any kind of approachment or alignment. But denying the, the right of a country to discuss with us and to negotiate with us would be, at the end, would be a denial of, this, of the sovereignty of a state. And as I said, we were aware of the discussions inside Ukraine and 
that's why the EU asked the Ukrainian government whether they were really committed to come to an agreement with the EU. And as I said, until last November, the answer was always yes. So what would have been the alternative for us to do? Ignoring that and say, no, there is a third uh, country or there is a third party that doesn't like it. And so we do not allow you to negotiate with us what you want to do. I don't think that this would have been an alternative. And now you ask about former or, or future policy activism with regard to our engagement in the Middle East and whether there was a, I think you asked whether there was a consensus about this. Well, first of all, there was no consensus at all, but uh, a clear parliamentary majority. And you know, without going too much into details of German domestic policy, let me tell you one thing. Um, the minister and me we served in the Labour Ministry until December last year. We had elections in Germany and we formed a new coalition. We are Christian Democrats, now we have a Social Democratic partner, and the Social Democrats insisted on being uh, responsible for the Labour Ministry, so we had to change. And now we are in the Defence Ministry, and some people say, oh, how can you do? How can you make labour market policy for years and then change? to defense policy. And I think one thing that is important for political leadership, you know, Germany ha has about 1% of the worldwide population and we consume 10% of uh, social security, uh, of money invested in social security. 1% of the population consuming 10% of all the social security policy in the world. But public opinion in Germany was usually that this was not enough that we were not social enough and that we should spend more on old age pensions, labor market policy and, and, and this was public opinion. And we had to set through a policy that we regarded as rational, also against public opinion, but with parliamentary majorities. And some things are similar with regard to defense policy. First of all, people accept the army, they like the army, and people were shocked about the atrocities that happened in Iraq and Syria. But being engaged there was not very popular in Germany. It's the same with Afghanistan. Our engagement in Afghanistan was not and is not popular among people, but we have always had a broad majority in the parliament for what we did. And so this is what we regard as a as our task as being the, in, the, in the leadership of the defense ministry to come to, to, to come to a perception of what is necessary and find the necessary parliamentary majorities for what we regard as necessary and of course trying to convince the public but, but this, is, this is a very different uh, difficult issue in, in, in many cases and we have come to the perception that we have, that it is necessary in, in this situation also to support uh, the Peshmerga in, uh, in, in, in the Kurdish area. I am happy to, to say that our engagement in the Baltics is undisputed in German Parliament and in German public. I don't see any objection against that. So in the Baltics, th this is much different from other regions in the world. But I mean, we all, I think we all have to realize that we have underestimated uh, the atrocities and also the capabilities of the Islamic State in that region. We had thought of the, <clears throat> of the capabilities that they had. And so we had to react on that, always together with our partners. We acted in accordance with the central government of Iraq and with the regional pro uh, government in, in, in North Iraq. And we did it together with all our partners in NATO and EU. That was of utmost importance for us. So what we say is, principally speaking, we have had to realize that we can't just hide as Germans. Whether we want or not, we are more than 80 million people. We are not a very poor state. So we can say we can't afford to do anything. 
So this is what we have had to realize and we are committed to, to take over responsibility. But there is no plan, so to speak, to deploy so and so many people in so and so many months in so and so many countries. But we have made clear that we still feel committed to the future of the people in Afghanistan in case the Afghan government wants us to be committed to that, uh, take part on that. Uh, we have made clear that we see that there are growing challenges in Africa and we see these atrocities and these challenges in the Near and Middle East. Mm -hmm. And it is always a case-by-case -case decision, of course. There is no automatism. It is a case-by-case -case decision, and in Germany, many of these decisions need a parliamentary approval. And even in case they don't, we don't need the, the approval formally, we want to rely on that, and we are happy that we have found it. So there is no... Uh, there is no clear uh, s uh, there is no plan to say we must be involved in these and these cases, but we are ready to take single case decisions uh, with regard to the responsibility that we feel to have and wants to repeat that. Our engagement you, in Brooks. the Baltic we, we Sea <laughs> is not at all disputed. We are running out of time, so Sorry. as a moderator I have still Sorry. to keep my promise to the right side of the audience. Very quickly, Yanis, you yeah, also uh, have some questions. To pick up on some of the more military part uh, of the questions, um, I would say uh, I, I agree nobody expected such war between Russia and Ukraine, but here those in the Baltic region that have been following the Russian uh, 2020 uh, modernization program and the way they develop their exercises, their patterns of behavior, I think we saw coming a uh, big crisis. That is, and one of the lessons learned from all of this is we have to really uh, translate what we see uh, correctly, not to pretend that it's, it's not happening. Uh, as for the uh, modernization uh, program, yes, it's going on. I would assume that now with the sanction uh, regime, it will slow down. Uh, I don't think it will be fully reached by 2020, but uh, we here have to uh, take for granted that uh, the kind of behavior we, uh, Julian just illustrated with, with, with different sorts of planes flying around our uh, borders, having a rather unfriendly behaviors is there to stay for a for, foreseeable time. What is important, What the way we answer. We answer with increased air policing, we answer with the C2 uh, elements here in the Baltic states, we, uh, we answer with the uh, military exercises that are pure Article 5 military exercises, uh, we answer with the pre-deployment of uh, enablers here. I think uh, that is the way to go. Uh, but, of course, very importantly, it is that we really uh, follow the uh, agreement uh, that has been reached at Wales about uh, stopping the decline of defence spending and uh, starting to raise it. It is time to, to wake up. If this, no, then when else? On the battle aircrafts uh, of the question of our Ukrainian friend, I would say we are part of NATO. NATO has by far the dominant air power in, in the world. The, our question is how to get in time this air power if the crisis happens in this region. And that is what Wales Summit uh, gave an answer to. And, uh, and that is, I think, what everybody has to now interpret and translate and understand that NATO is raising its readiness to answer to any kind of potential crisis in this region. Thank you, Janis. Now we can take questions from that side. Uh, Artis was the first one, then Oyars, and then we go floor to you. Yeah. Please take a mic, because otherwise... Yeah, thank you. Very quickly, three sides, or three questions. First, um, enemy of my enemy is not my friend, but it could be an ally, possibly. If we remember Second World War, Stalin was an ally of Western Alliance. What about ISIS and Assad? And two other questions uh, is, um, first, um, I'm applauding the German decision to give weapons to Peshmerga and Kurds. And uh, I was even more amazed that Greens have been supporting that and even advocating. 
uh, what about uh, weapons and military supply to Ukraine? And is there any problem or hesitation? And why is this hesitation is there on the countries in the Western side? And the third side regarding what you have been mentioning about not seeing trouble coming, uh, wouldn't it be correct to, uh, let's put it mildly, to admit that not everything with uh, so-called Ostpolitik was correct, taking into account the mutual engagement and mutual interdependency. Because once we speak about sanctions, we can see that on the one hand, we are, or many from us, are afraid to start sanction Russia because we are so much interdependent. Our idea was that once we are becoming interdependent, Russia is becoming liberal democracy. Now, in fact, what we are seeing, we are seeing the rise of Le Pen, we can see the rise of Orban, we can see the rise of nationalist movements who are applauding Putin and unwilling to have sanctions at all. Thank you. Thank you. Now, please give to Oyars. Yeah. Yes, I was college uh, chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Latvian Parliament. Janis mentioned that a lot of others in the world are watching, and one country that's watching very carefully is China. Um, we haven't talked much about China. And on the one hand, China's been somewhat inscrutable uh, in its response to these events, yet it has exploited the situation to at least make one advantageous gas deal. But China cannot be happy with a neighbor that is invading other neighbors, or worse, promoting separatism, secession, uh, breakaway republics. And so my question is, is there a tipping point that could bring China more involved, not so much militarily, but diplomatically? And is that tipping point Central Asia? Uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization has been meeting for the last two days, and that includes the Central Asian republics like Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, Russia, and China. Uh, would Russian involvement in Kazakhstan or some of these other republics be the tipping point for China to get more engaged? Thank you. Thank you, and please give a mic there, yeah, in the middle. Uh, I want to continue with the statement uh, you sir had uh, in, in, in the last round uh, and my provocative question would be oh, we heard that Russia is unpredictable and I want to question if this unpredictability is really that unpredictable. Uh, I want only to remind you that the uh, Russian strategy since 91 always clearly stated that their abstinence, their power political abstinence is not a voluntarily chosen one but it's due to economic weakness and will be altered as soon as Russia, what they intend, is back on the economic st stage. They, in the last and the latest strategy, have the terminus of privileged interests abroad, which clearly goes uh, to Russian uh, origin people in other countries that could be supported by military means. We have these exercises you mentioned. We had one in the East, we had one in Transcaucasus, we even had one in Kaliningrad. We have the modernization of the tank fleet. Uh, Chain's defense informs us that they already are about 10 divisions category A. They had Georgia, the case in Georgia, and they had the acid test in Syria. So my provocative question, is it really Russia who makes us believe they are unpredictable, or is Europe simply trapped by the comfortable idea to consume a peace dividend that never was there. Because uh, it was Europe that said we are deprived of an adversary, not the Russians. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There are still two questions pending from the previous session. If you both gentlemen promise to be short with your questions, then we could proceed one here and one here. Please. Yeah. Pl please be short with your question, yeah? And you then, Vladimir, too, yeah? General Klaus Wittmann, senior fellow at the Aspen Institute. I want to follow up what Janis Satz uh, said and also the unpredictability uh, thesis. I did not hear much from the panel about revisionism. So how do you in Riga read Russian intentions? Have they stumbled into this mess? Are they testing us or is there a master plan? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Klaus. Please, here. Please give to the lady over there. It's here. Vladimir Sokor, Jamestown Foundation. Uh, my question uh, concerns uh, another little type of revisionism, a subspecies, if you will, 
and that is the uh, retroactive misinterpretation of the NATO-Russia founding act. You will all remember the wording. NATO has no intentions or plans at this time in the existing situation to deploy substantial combat forces. This phrase was deliberately worded like this, elastically, to give NATO a free hand. Uh, now we hear reinterpretations retroactively that this somehow ties NATO's hands or restricts NATO's flexibility. In the course of the years, Russia tried to propose to negotiate with NATO a common definition of what substantial combat forces would mean. The American side and NATO properly rejected this because it would have implied negotiating with Russia ceilings on NATO force deployments. I'd like to hear especially from the German side. What are the reasons for Chancellor Merkel putting this sort of shackles around NATO's hands, which I believe to be paper shackles, easily jettisoned, and who would like to take up that case? Thank you. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, you have each three minutes for your answers. Probably this time we could start with you, Janis. Well, uh, thank you. I'll pick on, on some of the uh, questions. First, uh, the, uh, the question of peace dividend that was never there. Um, I would, by my previous uh, answer, I think it implied uh, that I would agree that we wanted to believe in the things that we wanted to be true, but they were not. And uh, particularly people here in the Baltic region, which were the first to see the signs, we were not much listened to. And that is, I think, something what we have to take as a lesson learned from the situation. I would point to another indicator, I think, which is very relevant because of the uh, Russian state setup where they have to prepare or to have the public opinion with their decisions and their propaganda has to work. I think a good indicator for anything to come is to watch a Russian TV. It indicates of their intentions, I think. Uh, then, is there a master plan? I, I would tend to say there is a big idea of Russia's greatness, which means not only with an internal, but with expansionist greatness. There are, let's say, contingencies pre-prepared for different areas that are of Russian interest. But I think Ukraine was a need and opportunity for Russians. And uh, thus, uh, it worked out that way, and I find personally very interesting to compare the, the two campaigns, if I may put it that way, the, the Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, and I think both Russians and us will have to make a very careful study and comparative study of both cases. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brauxipa, please. Yeah. Thank you. Well, three minutes. So first of all, with regard to the Islamic State and Assad, that was the question. For us, Assad is not our friend. And we must admit, we, we cannot uh, deliver an answer to all the challenges we face. And, and the fact that we do not regard Assad as a friend because he's an enemy of the Islamic State, this is exactly the reason why we thought we could be helpful in Iraq but we don't see any possibility for an engagement for the suppressed people in Syria, exactly because Assad has not become our friend now. With regard to China, we have been very constructive talks with China on these issues, of course, coming, having different points of view on many things, but uh, we talk with China in a very constructive way, and of course we have realized also the Chinese point of view in the UN Security Council on these issues, which was remarkable from our point of view. Now, with regard to the question of peace dividend, uh, unpredictability and economic weakness, first of all, I think indeed that there is some 
continuity in Russian policy. It is not a complete change, but it is at least a gradual change, no doubt about it. From today's point of view, some people think, and the tragedy for me is that uh, Putin is quite popular in Russia, whereas Gorbachev and Yeltsin are not popular at all, but I can tell you, when we ha negotiated on German reunification, we didn't get it for nothing. We didn't get it for nothing, but Gorbachev was in a, uh, in a disastrous economic situation and he got a lot of economic uh, uh, support from Germany at that time. So it was not just reunification for nothing, but this is obviously not uh, uh, very much known in the Russian public. And what we had to realize is that it does not need communism to justify an expansionist policy. In former times, in Soviet times, they talked about communism and that communism sooner or later would conquer the whole world. Now they do not talk about communism, but they talk about Eurasia. But mechanisms are to some extent similar. This is, what, this is a lesson that we had to learn. And indeed, what we see today is that the economic weakness of some country causes troubles. The economic weakness of Russia uh, does certainly at least to some extent contribute to the unconstructive uh, and aggressive behavior uh, to, to the outside world, but there has been a peace dividend. The important issue is, as I said, we, we've had half a million soldiers in former times, now it is a smaller number, so we have enjoyed the peace dividend, but the reality is the time of peace dividend is over in so far that we can no longer afford to have a smaller army to invest less in, uh, in armament, so we will not go back to the time we had. So we could have enjoyed the peace dividend, but we have to be all aware, and Germany has to be aware, and Germany is aware, that now we have to focus on the question, what do we have to invest in order to protect our freedom? It is not, for, it, it is not a free lunch. Freedom is not a free lunch. Independence is not a free lunch. Reunification was not a free lunch, and we'll have to be very aware of that. Thank you very much. These were three minutes, I think. Yes, perfect. Absolutely. <laughs> Simon. I, I can do this in less than three minutes. Uh, the, uh, the four points that came up, and I think we can do those in eight sentences. Uh, one with regard to enemies, the enemies of my enemies and not my friends. This doesn't mean that I won't have an affair with my enemies <laughs> once in a while <laughs> over a specific <laughs> issue with Russia over Syria, with uh, Iran over Iraq, uh, with the devil over the good Lord. Uh, those things do happen, but there ain't going to be no wedding. <laughs> and, 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 and I think that uh, I can be categorical. In the United States, we do insist on compatibility. Uh, point two has to do with uh, the unpredictability of events. Look, every single event is unpredictable. What can be predicted are the consequences of unpredictable events. <laughs> and that's what you prepare for. With regard to Ukraine, with all due respect, Ukraine is an issue that has been building up since 1991. And somebody should have noticed. Somebody should have noticed. Uh, but we'll let it at that cannot predict events, but I can prepare. That's why I pointed out to Iran. There is going to be an issue there, which leads me to the tipping point. There has been no consumer of security, stability, and prosperity more compelling than China over the past 20 years. Germany might have qualified, but Germany began to tip and produce security, stability, and security over the past 10 to 15 years, beginning in Kosovo, for that matter. But China is a consumer of all of those things, and the time is coming when this form of passivity will have to end. And I think that Susan Roy, the National Security Advisor, was just in Beijing saying, hey, you got, you want to do something. Think about it. On the day after a military strike, not by the United States in Iran, if there was to be one, there will be two resolutions at the Security Council of the United Nations. 
One American, one Russian. Chinese will have to pick. Will have to pick. They will not be able to say, hey, we just don't aim at being a superpower. We just have money, you know, but that's okay. It's coming. It's coming. And it will be interesting to see how they start producing a bit. And I'm using more than my eight sentences so on, 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 on the master plan of Russia law. This is expansion by improvisation. It's that simple. I don't believe for a second there is master plan. Put in big opportunities, probes, but he understands, I think, touch wood, the limits. And the limits do relate to his vulnerability. He's paying a price right now. He's paying a price. BB thought that by going to Gaza, his public opinion polls would climb dramatically, which they did. The moment the war ended, 65 widows or mothers who had lost their children, whatever it is, brought about a drop of his popularity, 25 percentage points. In a matter of days, a couple of weeks, Putin is paying a price, which is eventually will turn to his own standing within the country. So it is indeed expansion by improvisation, and uh, there are limits to that. Thank you very much. Precisely three minutes. Two minutes. So, <laughs> uh, dear audience, uh, panelists, we are slowly uh, moving to the end of our session. And uh, when I introduced uh, the essence of the panel, uh, I already explained that we were supposed to cover a very wide range of issues, but at the same time to remain in the same geographical area. And I think that uh, because of extremely uh, well-prepared presentations of our panelists and their fantastic knowledge of the subject, we succeeded to be everywhere in China, in Kazakhstan, and the United States, but still remain in the Baltic Sea region. And if we look backwards uh, at the last 20, 25 years uh, of uh, history of the Baltic Sea region, then we evidenced that this area used to be a quiet corner in, the U in Europe. It was a periphery of Europe. At one point, it became the hot spot of Europe, countries expanding, some countries resisting, then at another point we became the most competitive region in the world, the most globalized region in the world, and now Simone reminded us that uh, living in the future, uh, in the past tense, something what sometimes we are doing. But we will need a lot of innovation, a lot of discussions, a lot of uh, new ideas to uh, give new impetus to the region. And uh, my wish would be that all those, again, thousands of discussions about environment, about employment, about gender balance, and very many other issues would not overshadow security of the region. So let's work hard for secure and safe region. Thank you. And please join me in the round of applause to thank our panelists. Thank you.